Thank you very much. Uh, one of the reasons I've been invited along tonight is that I'm one of the very few um, flag wavers in favour of federalism. Uh, often when you come to any uh, political discussion on federalism, some of the first questions that are asked is, well, why do we have a federation? Surely it would be much more efficient if we didn't have one, you know, that the system is broken, and particularly that we're over-governed. Have you ever noticed that Australians have an absolute obsession with the notion that as a nation we are over-governed because we have three levels of government, and somehow that this is a very shocking thing? Uh, so what I'd like to start with, before getting on to the current proposals for reform is just some uh, review of uh, why we actually do have a federation and why a federation is a good thing um, and what the good elements of it are so that when we're reforming our federal system, we can reform it with a view to improving upon those good elements of federalism, making our federal system the best that we possibly can. So I'd just like to start with the myths, um, the ones that at least I find very irritating. And the first one of those is that we are over-governed because we have three levels of government. Um, now, I've actually had a bit of a look at this, and if you do, you'll notice that most democratic countries have at least three levels of government and frequently four levels of government. Um, why do we think three levels of government are excessive? It seems to me that it's primarily because there's two countries we compare ourselves against in this circumstance, and they are the United Kingdom and New Zealand. Now, first of all, remember that both of those countries, um, unitary systems, very small geographical area. Um, but secondly, when people say that they've only got two levels of government, what they don't realise is that um, in many cases they have actually two levels of local government giving three levels overall. So if you look at New Zealand, there are regional and local levels of government there. If you look at the United Kingdom, you've had devolution. So you've also got, you know, governments in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. But even in, the, in England itself, you find, for example, Boris Johnson, the, the, the mayor of London, but you'll also find another mayor of the city of London. You'll find two levels of local government in most of, of England. Um, so it's, first of all, it's incorrect um, to um, compare ourselves with New Zealand and, and the United Kingdom and say that we are exceptionally overgoverned when they are not. Um, and um, secondly, it's also if you compare ourselves to other more relevant comparators, you'll see that, um, the, that we are not by any means overgoverned by having three levels of government. So why do we want at least three levels of government, even in those countries that have unitary systems? And the answer is that uh, at the local level, people want a local government that's close to them to deal with the things that they deal with every day, with car parks, with libraries, um, with you know fixing potholes in the road down the street and all those sorts of things. They want people that they know, who they can influence, uh, and um, who understand their local concerns. Uh, when you get to other issues, though, like education, um, hospitals, policing, you need some sort of levels of um, um, efficiency uh, in order to be able to deal with them sensibly. So you need to deal with them either at a state or a regional level. Uh, but when it comes to other issues like defence, external affairs, immigration, logically they're the sorts of things that you want to deal with at a national level. Um, if you try and end up with just two levels of government, which I have to say for a country like Australia would be unprecedented, uh, you find that the result is that it all moves further away from the people. You end up with your local government turning into a regional government and taking away local control over local issues and you end up with um, regional governments proliferating, say 50 or 60 of them, um, where you're trying to coordinate um, things in terms of, you know, policing, education and health, and that's not really efficient either. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, geography is another indicator of why Australia has three levels of government. Every country with a landmass as large as, Aust uh, as Australia um, is a federation with at least three levels of government, except for communist China, which, um, apart from being communist, um, is also regarded these days as a quasi-federation anyway. Um, in terms of the biggest economies in the world, um, the G8 countries, 
uh, are all either federations or countries that have engaged in significant devolution in recent years. Seven of eight of them have at least three tiers of government and the United Kingdom being the only outlier with two to three, depending upon what you count. Uh, if you look at democratic countries with a similar population to Australia, they all have at least three levels of government. It's simply not possible, as far as I can tell, and if anyone finds one, do let me know, uh, to find a democratic country with a similar geographical size or a similar population to Australia that has fewer levels of government than Australia does. The second great myth about federalism is that it's a drain on, uh, an economic drain on the country and that it's less efficient than a unitary system. Now, you can understand why people think that. Intuitively, you'd think, you know, more levels of government, extra public servants is going to cost more money. In fact, the, the evidence is the reverse. Uh, in the last 50 years, the world's federal economies have consistently outperformed the non-federal economies, and the more decentralised countries are in terms of their government, the better their economic performance. Uh, without internal competition, governments tend to become inefficient, overstaffed and expensive to run. And if you think about that in terms of monopolies, you can see exactly what happens to governments when they're in that position. So if you compare Australia against the United States, um, Canada, the United Kingdom and New Zealand in terms of the cost of government as a share of GDP, it's the two unitary countries, the United Kingdom and New Zealand, which have the most costly governments, while the three federations, the United States, Australia and Canada, are the cheapest governments to run. And according to the OEC, OECD figures, the proportion of public sector workers, when you add them all up together at all levels of government, the proportion of public sector workers um, in, is greater in unitary states than it is in federations. Um, equally, public sector spending as a share of GDP is much higher in unitary states than it is in federations. In brutal terms, if Australia were to become a unitary state with just two levels of government, um, rather than being a federation, we would be most likely to end up with more public service, much more expensive government, and a government that works much less efficiently. Uh, so briefly, before I get on to the um, current issues, um, Robert did ask me to um, outline the benefits of federalism. What are they? First of all, a check on power. Um, the great thing about federalism is it prevents governments from being all-powerful and behaving in oppressive and arbitrary ways. So, for example, you often find human rights campaigners like Michael Kirby support the idea of federalism simply because it's a way of protecting rights of the individual from all-powerful governments. Second issue, choice and diversity. If each of your states in Australia has its own education system and its own curriculum. If you don't like it because the curriculum has been dumbed down, you can move to another state, okay? If you've got a national curriculum and it's appalling, the only thing you can do is leave the country. And that is not a particularly easy thing to do in many circumstances. Um, equally, diversity. You would not have the same number of different institutions museums, art galleries, universities, and all those sorts of things across Australia if you didn't have state capitals in all of the different states. Like some countries like France, for example, uh, all the main institutions are centralised in Paris. But Australia, because we have states, um, gives us that diversity of having those different institutions in different places. Um, the third one is customisation of policies. Uh, federalism is really important in a very large country like Australia because it allows policies to be customised to meet the different needs of people in different parts of the country. So it accommodates differences and it brings democratic decision making closer to the people that it affects. Um, competition from an economic point of view is really important when it comes to federalism. Um, I know as a person who previously worked in the New South Wales Cabinet Office that the first thing that happened when comparative results came out was that you get a phone call from the Premier saying, why is Western Australia doing better than us on this? Um, how can we find out what they're doing and do it better? Uh, and that's what we were told to do. And because of that, you get a ratcheting up process of improvement. Um, and that brings me to the next point, which is creativity and innovation. 
Uh, when you have a federal system, you have the opportunity for a state to do things that are different, to try and innovate and improve. Now, if it's a screaming disaster, WA Inc. or something of that kind, at least it doesn't infect the rest of the country. And if it's successful, it tends, up, tends to be picked up by the other states. And so you get a constant process of improvement rather than if you've just got one central government with nothing to compare about, you get everything dumbed down to the lowest level. Uh, and the last point here is cooperation. Now, some people would say that that's the antithesis of federalism, that federalism is all about conflict. Um, but look, again, that's just not true. My experience as a public servant was that 95% of the time, there were enormous amounts of cooperation between the Commonwealth and the states. Of course, the media will never report upon cooperation. It will never report about success. It will only report on conflict because as far as they're concerned, that's the only interesting thing. But it does lead to a completely misrepresentative idea of how the federal system works. Much of the time, it works successfully through discussion, development of ideas and um, cooperation. And the really good thing about cooperation is that it stops the extreme swings of policy. So again, if you compare us to New Zealand, look at the New Zealand economic position is most commonly affected by the fact that they don't have an upper house, they don't have a federal system, so that when a government comes into government in New Zealand, at least before MMP, used to get very extreme swings economically one way to another, and it didn't very much help their economy. Australia has always been more moderate because in terms of economic policy and all sorts of other things, you have to get out there and explain to the people and convince the states to cooperate with the federal government to achieve an agreed outcome. That results in more moderation, but most importantly, better public scrutiny, uh, which results in better outcomes. Okay, that's my spruiking for the Federation and why it's a good thing. But the question is, well, how do we improve upon what we've got? Uh, we do have inherently a good system of government, uh, but it does need um, retuning, it does need occasional um, repair, it does need uh, reconsideration in order to maximise those benefits um, from federal federalism. Um, it's obvious um, that our system of government could be significantly improved, but as Nick Greiner said, by clarifying which level of government is responsible for which particular functions, by ensuring that each level of government has access to the sources of revenue needed to fund its responsibilities, and by removing as much as possible the involvement of two levels or more of government in dealing with the same uh, political same policy issues. Now, often that's just not possible. There are areas where Commonwealth and state matters are just so entwined, it's impossible to unravel them. And health is one of those areas. And that is because the constitution gives the Commonwealth powers in relation to things like pharmaceutical, sickness and hospital benefits, as well as medical services, while at the same time, it's the states that run the hospital system. Um, so there are clearly going to be areas where the Commonwealth um, and the states do need to work together to achieve the best outcome, but there will also be areas where the Commonwealth could simply withdraw and leave matters for the states to deal with sensibly and efficiently without this constant problem with the Commonwealth coming and interfering with conditions on grants um, into these areas and resulting in duplication and um, gaming of the system and cost shifting and all those sorts of things. Uh, the National Commission of Audit, um, which I agree with Nick Reiner, said very sensible things about federalism, and it's unfortunate that just got lost completely in the budget debate. Um, but the National Commission of, of Audit mentioned a number of areas um, where the Commonwealth could helpfully withdraw in order to clarify the, ro the roles and responsibilities of the levels of government. Now, most new prime ministers, as we know, have some kind of a new federalism policy. Um, usually in their back pocket, and they intend to revolutionise the system. Now, you'll all remember Kevin Rudd, um, Kevin 07, swept to power with a promise to end the blame game, remove most of the conditions on grants, consolidate them down to a small number of broad grants, um, and allow the states to fulfil their um, functions in a sensible way. Now, once elected, many meetings were held 
Um, the midnight oil was definitely burnt, um, in fact, burnt out many public servants. If you've ever met anyone who went through that COAG process, um, who survived, they were all um, seriously traumatised by it. Um, and much paper was churned around to achieve those promises. Uh, but conditional grants, like zombies, seem unable to be killed. Renamed as national partnerships, they arose from their grave and continued to walk the walk of the living dead, dripping in prescriptive conditions, oozing with administrative burdens and sucking the life force from the federal system. Now, the promise in 2007 was that the 196 existing grant programs would be reduced to six. Um, how many do we have now? Well, it's grown back to 140. We haven't got quite back to 196, but you can see it's happening. Um, as soon as, I, mean, I remember giving a speech um, about these issues um, shortly after they'd done this consolidation and created this new category called national partnerships. And the one thing I said is that's the back door by which the bureaucracy will bring all these things, all these prescriptive conditions back into existence. And it was absolutely true. It's one of those occasions where you don't want to be right, um, but um, unfortunately I definitely was. Um, again, the National Commission of Audit in commenting on this um, says that the growth in the number of agreements has contributed to a significant growth in reporting and administrative expenses. An additional bureaucracy is required to develop, report on, review and assess the agreements, which takes resources away from service delivery and gives rise to second guessing and duplication. Now, why, one may well ask, do these reforms always seem to fail? Um, as best I can see, the, there's two answers. One is arrogance and the other is power. Uh, the arrogance of federal politicians and public servants is not to be underestimated. Uh, they work on the assumption that they always know better and that any problem that exists can only be resolved by their superior knowledge. Having no experience whatsoever in running schools or hospitals does not seem to impede in any way their confidence that they are the ones who should impose the rules about how those institutions should be run. Nor is their arrogance dented in the slightest by the fact that the matters that do fall within their jurisdiction, such for ex as, for example, defence procurement, are so often the subject of waste, profligate spending and poor management. Power is the other critical factor. From the bureaucracy side, it's all about building empires of departments and agencies, even when they have little, if any, relationship to the powers that are actually allocated to the Commonwealth by the Constitution. Uh, but from the political side, it's all about spending money in a way that's most likely to result in the party in government, whatever that may be, uh, being re-elected to office. There is no head of power in Section 51 of the Constitution to fund surf clubs, aquatic centres and football grounds. Nor, from the point of view of the principle of subsidiarity, is there any justification whatsoever in the Commonwealth doing so. Yet plenty of money is splashed around for these projects come election time, particularly in marginal seats. It is simply wrong on all levels for this to occur and really it ought to be stopped. The question is, who will have the courage to do that? Uh, the biggest change, therefore, that needs to be made is the hardest type of change, and that is cultural change. It needs to be accepted by all that the reform of the federal system is the next great economic change that Australia must make to achieve its prosperity. We've done a lot already. We had national competition policy, which Nick Greiner was involved in, which made huge gains for Australia but we're not going to get to the next level of economic efficiency and performance unless we do this. So unless the bureaucracy and the politicians and the population can be convinced that this is the necessary change to make, it is not going to happen. Uh, while clarifying roles and responsibilities is, is important, um, the biggest change that needs to take place is in the field of federal st state finances. We need to assess regularly the cost of the various functions of government as a proportion of our GDP, and then we need to make sure that each level of government has access to the same proportion of public revenue to match its spending responsibilities. 
Ideally, this would be done by significantly reducing Commonwealth taxes and giving the states the capacity and economic room to raise the taxes necessary to support their functions while keeping the overall tax burden on the people at the same level or hopefully a lower level um, if that can achieve um, the anticipated efficiencies. This would ensure that the states were more accountable because they would have the responsibility uh, for the burden of taxing and therefore have a greater incentive to keep taxes down and use the money raised as efficiently as possible. However, it has to be recognised that for constitutional and economic reasons, um, some taxes do need to be imposed centrally. In those cases, consideration needs to be given to how to achieve tax sharing in a way that does not permit the Commonwealth to impose conditions on the states or interfere with state policies or starve the states of necessary funding. Equally, it needs to be done in a way that ensures that the states share the political responsibility for taxing. If we could rebalance the federal state financial system so that each level of government was largely capable of funding itself and fulfilling its own responsibilities, this would significantly reduce the ability of the Commonwealth to use conditional grants to involve itself in policy areas beyond its constitutional allocation. Section 96 of the Constitution, that's the grants power, could return to its original function as an emergency power that would only be used when a state was suffering some unexpected uh, financial crisis and needed temporary help. help. That provision was never intended to be the main way by which the Commonwealth would fund the states. Uh, Robert also asked me very briefly to speak about constitutional issues. Again, like um, Nick Greiner, I think that it's um, pointless to try and make um, these sorts of changes through a referendum. Uh, the obvious change to make would be to allow the states to impose taxes on goods, which they can't at the moment. But given that turkeys don't vote for Christmas, the general idea that the population of Australia would vote to allow the states to impose extra taxes on them, I think, is um, so implausible, it's really not worth the, the money wasting um, our effort trying to do that. Um, but instead, a lot can be achieved simply by the Commonwealth withdrawing from areas of um, state responsibility and making sure that the states have sufficient room to fund um, their own responsibilities through tax revenue. The National Commission of Audit has already made recommendations on how to improve the federal system. As Nick Greiner said, one of their recommendations was to allow the states a role um, in income tax revenue as long as the Commonwealth actually makes room for that by reducing their own um, income tax. That's one way of doing it. It may be that there are other ways um, that that could be achieved as well. Um, in addition, the Commonwealth's white paper on the Federation um, is being conducted concurrently with one on taxation, the taxation system. Um, and those two issues are intimately linked. And I'm a bit worried in a way that they're, they're running them in two sort of parallel sessions. Um, uh, really, the, you know, if they come out with completely different recommendations, apart from giving the Commonwealth a way out of not doing anything, which is probably what it hopes to do, um, it um, may not be terribly sensible. Um, the real problem is if the Commonwealth withdraws from areas of state responsibility, but does it just as a means of cost shifting onto the states that's not achieving anything in terms of, re of, of reforming the federal system. And that's what we've been seeing recently in the budget, withdrawal from areas just as a means of pushing costs back onto the states when the states don't have the power to um, raise the money to fulfil those responsibilities. If we're going to do this, we need to take the two sides together. You need to fix the system in relation to taxation and access to the money to be able to fund the responsibilities and match that with the responsibilities um, that each level of government has. Um, restoring our federal system to full operational efficiency does not involve rocket science, but it will involve cultural change and, most importantly, leadership. Uh, and that's what, so far, we have been lacking. We need the leadership at the national and the state level. Um, and, you know, we have examples of that from the period where um, Bob Hawke um, and Nick Greiner and others led in terms of competition policy. That was hard. Some state governments even possibly fell on the basis of implementing those sorts of reforms. But because they were reforms that were bipartisan, 
Um, both sides of government accepted them and because they were reforms that were accepted at both the Commonwealth and the state level and because the benefits of those reforms flowed through not only to the Commonwealth level to the, but to the state level and everybody recognised that it was important, it was able to be achieved. Um, what we need today in order to uh, reform the, the um, Federation is true leadership. And in doing this, it will require the courage to give up some of the influence and power that the Commonwealth currently has by controlling vast swathes of public revenue. But the payback for making that sacrifice will be immense in terms of economic prosperity of Australia in the future. Thank you.